When you hear the word schizophrenia, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Uh, people talking to themselves. People with multiple problems. People wandering in the street. People are afraid. People that, you know, are psycho. I started to hear voices uh, when I was 17 years old. Somebody with emotional problems. Somebody who's having a pretty rough time in life. I couldn't really make out what they were saying. I think it's split personality, but I remember that it's not. I think it's more like you hear voices. It was like wind, like wishing a wind. Voices in the head. Hearing voices. If you had to hear voices all the time, I could see how it could drive you nuts. I used to think I had tuberculosis of the brain. Problem in the... Uh... In, uh, in brain. It's something bad. I knew that. A mental disease. I couldn't even go to a phone book to find a phone number. Disorientation. Sort of out of touch with reality. I was sure that people knew what I was thinking. Paranoia. Knew what I was hearing. Having irregular thought patterns. I was hearing full-fledged voices. Flipping out. Kill yourself. Kill your mother, kill your sister. Imagine if you heard a, a counterfactual voice in your head telling you horrible things about yourself. I totally believe that uh, kill your mother, you know, kill your sister. the devil had taken me over. A psychopath. I don't know uh, much about schizophrenia, and neither do I. Could you give me some examples of hallucinations you had? Faucets running blood. To be honest, the word crazy would come to mind. My gut reaction is crazy. The whole thing smells like feces anyway. One second it'll be someone, next second it'll be crazy. 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 People used to run maggots. They would have maggots all over them. People that are crazy? Probably crazy. It's kind of crazy. Crazy. There's no other way to describe it but terror. Crazy people locked up in uh, small rooms. You find yourself sitting crowded up against a wall. Crazy people? Crazy people. In this purely defensive posture. Absolutely insane. I've never said any of this before. It's very, very difficult. Crazy. I would spend most of my classes in the woman's bathroom. Madness. I was building a fort. Straight jackets and asylums and um, all my worst fears realized. I was going to drive off of Irvine Park. There was a cliff there. Unstable. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. I was admitted to the uh, neuropsychiatric uh, unit. Psychiatry, medication. I was started on Thorazine. Pills. Stelazine. Drugs. And Cogentin. Scary. It made me so extremely sedated. A life of confusion. I could barely walk. It makes it hard to have a life. Astonic reactions. Uncontrolled behavior. Something wrong with the person. I had no hope. That's sadness. They told my mother. Mental illness. She needed to realize. Mental illness. I had an illness. Mental illness. That nobody gets well from. Mental illness. Nobody recovers from. Mental illness. And she needed to take care of her other children. Severe mental illness. My diagnosis was uh, schizophrenia. <laughs> I have never met a schizophrenic whose life wouldn't have driven me crazy if I had lived it. Not as the life is described in the uh, hospital record by people who don't want to hear what it was like, but the life as when I finally get to know what this person has experienced, there's no question I would be just as sick and in just the same way that this patient is. And in fact, I've never worked with a schizophrenic where I have not walked away from some session with the feeling, my God, a human being has lived this way. My father was killed in Korea when I was 10 months old. My mom at that time was pregnant with my sister, Cindy. And what I remember from a very early age is the depression my mom went through and feeling it was my fault. I feel that that kind of left a, a lasting impression in me. I had to be extra good or else my mom might not be with me or might want to leave me or I, I felt it was up to me to keep her love. Her mother was not a person who understood separate identity either. 
Her mother regarded Catherine as the reincarnation of Catherine's dead father. So Catherine was this unperson. When I was six years old, my mom remarried, and she remarried another Marine. And at the time that she remarried, uh, it wasn't really apparent that he had a problem with alcohol. But as, as time went on, it became more and more apparent. When he drank, he would be very verbally uh, mean. He was usually drunk in the evenings, uh, late afternoons, all the way up until 9 when he went to bed. There was always that fear that he would become physically violent because at times he would go right up to her and say, you know, like this. And as a, a, a small kid, seeing that, is, it just terrifies you. If you're dealing with someone who's schizophrenic, you have to assume their life has been god-awful. You also have to assume they're terrified. And of course, if you are terrified and have a life that has terrified you, then why should you trust someone? What do you have to transfer that would make you trust somebody who says, I'm here to help you? Well, lots of people have said that who aren't the least bit helpful. And of course, starting with their parents and going on to other people who have been authority figures who weren't helpful, including mental health professionals who said, I'm here to help you and have done things that have been very hurtful. The start that I remember was when I was six and I was coming home from the hospital from having had all that surgery. What surgery did you have? I had four kidneys and four ureters. So I was wetting myself all over the place and getting hit for it and getting stuff for it. And there was no way I could have controlled any of it. Well, they finally found out what that was and they did the surgery on it. But the thing was that they, they said things like, we're gonna operate on your doll and they, they did all kinds of cystoscopy, which is excruciatingly painful. It was in those days. They've done all kinds of better stuff now. Although I'm scared as hell of it when I have I hear it. it's still pretty bad. It's not good, but it doesn't, it, it's not a screamer. It used to be a screamer because the materials were bigger and they'd force it open and do all that stuff. And then they'd say it wouldn't hurt. And they'd say that again, and you'd have another one and another one. And you don't know the difference between, between um, urethra and vagina anyway when you're before, be, before all that fun stuff happens. <laughs> uh, so it all seemed like the down there part and leaking and bleeding and all of that stuff. When I was coming home from the hospital, it was raining, and the tears were running down the window of the car, and a voice said, that this is going to be your life. All the symptoms that are used to diagnose mental disorders are functional for people in some way. They help them. They help them. They're, they're somehow helpful. They, they, help, they enable people to avoid uh, pain, to protect themselves, to feel better about themselves, to feel exalted, to retreat. So essentially the psychosis is a way to distance themselves from something that's so overwhelming they just don't know how to deal with. When I was eight years old is when I first felt suicidal thoughts. And they were scary. It's not that I wanted to feel suicidal. It was like, wow, I want out of here. This poured into my school too. I began feeling really different really strange. I got teased a lot called uh, bulgy eyeballs, witchy, all these names. And yet I couldn't come home and tell my mom or my dad how bad I felt, how strange I felt. Nobody liked me, you know, because if I did, I would upset them. Right. So, so at an early age, I started developing an alternate way to deal with all the pain because it was extremely painful. There was a separation between me and people until they all got to be generic. 10 was when others came to me and said, 
You're not of them. There's another place where, where you belong. You're not of them. People came to you? Not people. Some things. <sighs> People who become psychotic, whatever word we want to use for it, the reality they've lost touch with is other people. They no longer feel a sufficient connection to other human beings to feel like a human being. I don't know what it was that I was projecting that made people hate me or dislike me or become angry. I know it must have been something because it was almost universal. When my father was drinking, he would call me Fatty Kathy. Did you take an ugly pill today? And he would always say, why are you making your mother unhappy? When he was actually causing it later on when I was a teenager, why are you wearing your, your, your dress so short? You want to be a whore, a bitch? He was a um, misogynist. Um, uh, he would uh, practice that, as it were, when he was drunk. But he would go after the girls in the family. Um, makeup, and why are you wearing that makeup? And that dress is so short you can see your... And he would say it. So she had no ally. One of the things that schizophrenia does is it saves you from, from real-world traumas. I witnessed a murder. How old were you? 12. I think that would have been traumatic in somebody's life, but it wasn't really in mine. By that time, I was so far gone, it didn't matter to me. I was in the sixth grade, and the seventh was a girl named Kathy. And she came with two teenage boys, and they attacked a kid who was carrying some laundry home. In a, in a bag, and they knifed him. I mean, they were playing around with him first. They would have hit him, they would have, I don't know, cut open his laundry or something. But she said, are you men or what? So they knifed him. And he was li lying there, bleeding, and there was blood pouring out. There was a lot of it. Did you talk about it with your parents back then? Never. With anybody? No. So you witnessed a murder and you just sat with it all alone? Yeah. What would have happened had you told your parents? I don't know. I was in an anti-Semitic camp for three years and I didn't tell them. I really started becoming very religious. I would say my rosary on stone. On stone, what does that mean? Well, you know, there's stones in gardens. There's these stones. Well, do you, like, sit on pebbles. a stone? I wouldn't, no, I'd kneel. Oh, you, that must have hurt. It did. I, I had, um, my knees were pretty scraped because I had read stories of the saints where they would make themselves pleasing to God by inflicting self-harm because that way God would know that they really loved him and wanted to live for him and all this stuff. So I felt... If no one else wanted me, God would want me. You try desperately. You try so hard. And you look at other people, you try to act like them. It doesn't work, so you try something else, and that doesn't work. Nothing helps. Human beings get to feel helpless. And that that's the fundamental problem that human beings have. You know, we are born very helpless. And when life gets overwhelming, we fall back into the helplessness. Parents try to dress it up. People try to dress it up. Well, she's creative. She's sensitive. She's this and that. If only you would do something with your hair, dress a little better, get out a little more. Out is, out is not where I want to be. And dressing is, is, is putting a dress on a warthog. What do you think causes schizophrenia? I don't know. Chemical imbalances. Some sort of neurological process that went haywire. Something is wrong in the brain. In my abnormal psychology textbook, there was something about it's like nature and nurture. Like there are certain 
things like having abusive parents or being sexually abused as a child like increases the chances that you'll be schizophrenic, but it's also a chemical imbalance in the brain. All right, let's go to the broken brain theory, okay, because this is important because this is sort of the crux of the fraud that has been told to people. Maybe a chemical imbalance, I think it could be. Something depleted in your brain, like some chemical, it's that there's too much of it or not enough of it. You go to Washington Square Park and ask people what is schizophrenia? A chemical imbalance, I guess. I'm pretty sure that it's, it's a neurological disorder. Overload of brain activity. They have broken brains, the drugs help fix it. People with schizophrenia symptoms are often helped by medications that act on the brain, so that makes me think that it's a brain disorder. When I was a, a newspaper reporter, I used to write that stuff. Alterations in the chemicals of the brain. Biological factor? Chemical imbalance. Because that's what people told me. It's an imbalance. DNA. Neurologically disease. But it is intellectual fraud. Chemical imbalance? I'm sure the condition has always been there. It's part of the human genome and memnome. It's easy to prove that it's fraud. I mean, a guy named Kenneth Kindler, who's a editor of one of the magazines, journals, I think it's Physiologic, uh, I forget exa exactly which one. In 2005, he says, we have looked for these chemical imbalances and we have not found them. Most likely chemical imbalances in the brain. A guy by the name of Arvid Carlson was one of the initial promoters of this uh, hypothesis. 1992 says it didn't pan out. It's just a brain disorder that develops. Hormonal, mental imbalance. Chemical imbalance. John Cain said in 1993 or 94, big psychiatric researchers, the dopaminergic uh, hypothesis is no longer credible. I have a neuro degree, so I know it's an imbalance of uh, dopamine receptors. Didn't pan out. Something that is just not firing right in your brain. Didn't happen. Could be an organic thing in the brain. Oh. In fact, if you want, I'll get you a book by Steve Hyman, okay, who was a former director of, of NIMH, and he said there's no evidence, this is in 2002, of a lesion in the dopaminergic system in schizophrenia. Some sort of chemical imbalance. So why does the public s believe something differently? I would assume a chemical imbalance. Because they lie to us. Chemical imbalance in the brain? It's sort of a combination of drug companies. Chemical imbalances. Groups that they fund, they provide money to. Some sort of chemical imbalance. Like the National Alliance for Mentally Ill. Chemical imbalance in the brain. The psychiatric researchers, when they're talking to reporters, they'll say, I remember when I was first reporting on this, they would say, these drugs are like insulin for diabetes. Maybe, maybe it needs to be drugs in the same way that um, a diabetic. And I'd say, well, how so? And they'd say, oh, it's correcting this chemical problem. Chemical imbalance in the brain. OK, OK, I'd write that. Physiological or chemical. Then later, once I did my own research, I'd come back and say, and they'd say, oh, it's like insulin for diabetes. And I'd say, well, no, it's not. It's not what you found. And they'd say, oh, you're right. Every time, oh, you're right. And i said, say, well, why do you tell people that then? Chemical imbalance in the brain. And they'd say, oh, because it gets people to take their drugs. Well, I don't know too much about it, but I know that um, you need medication. It's a convenient slogan. Chemical imbalance. Chemical imbalance. Chemical imbalance. I said, but you're lying. They'd say, oh, but we know the drugs are good for them, blah, blah, blah. You have to take your pills. Well, why don't you just tell them that we think your drugs are good for you, but we don't know what's wrong with your brain? Probably a chemical imbalance. Isn't it wrong to tell somebody that, it's, that they have something wrong with their brain when you don't know that? Can you tell me what a mental health professional might best say to not help someone with schizophrenia recover? Well, the usual thing. You have this genetic physiological disorder which is incurable, but with the best of modern treatment, by which I mean medication, you can be marginally acceptable to most people most of the time. What do you think is the best treatment for schizophrenia? Medicine. Medication. 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 Well, if I was a doctor, I would probably say drugs. What's happened now in the psychiatric residencies is they've been trained to treat psychotic individuals, that the word treat has come to mean medicate. They've been told talking with these people can be very dangerous to them. So don't try doing uncovering work with them. They, by and large, aren't trained that well to, to do psychotherapy with anybody. I once uh, asked a therapist, you know, if there were any brain disorders that were beyond uh, you know, traditional treatment, and he said the only one that's not really treatable is schizophrenia. Um, but I know that there are medications that help. Virtually all 
postgraduate education in psychiatry nowadays is paid for by drug companies. Psycho, pharmaceutical. Some type of pharmaceutical. I think the drugs. I think they're more and more new drugs. Probably medication. Medicine. Mental hospital. I don't know. <laughs> you have to see a psychiatrist, you know, get some drugs. Helping people, the most fundamental thing is to help them get over feeling helpless. To help them understand they can actually figure things out and make decisions, make choices. Um, and you can't do that if you're giving medication because you're saying to them, you can't do it. You need a drug. Medication? Medication. 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 Chemical stabilization. First of all, you've got to stabilize this person. When I met Catherine, I was a first year resident at UCLA. They sat down, she and her mother, in this little room where I interviewed her. And she sat with her head down, and her hair was all over the front of her face, so you couldn't see her face, just the top of her head. And the only word she said during the interview uh, was, I need to be in a hospital. So I admitted her up onto the ward at UCLA, and I intended to do to treat her psych with psych psychotherapy only. The uh, evidence is that if the, most people who get real therapy do get better. Uh, it may take a lot of work, or it may take a little work. Well, it usually takes a lot of work if they're schizophrenic, because people who are schizophrenic have very serious problems. The research that says it's not effective is oftentimes done with therapists that don't know how to do the, the therapy maybe don't even want to do this kind of treatment. It's hard work. It's gut-wrenching, grueling work. Working with schizophrenics challenge our own um, sense of ourselves and our own beings in many, many ways. And so um, sometimes that can be exciting, and sometimes it can be pretty threatening. Sometimes you, you feel you're going out of your mind. Dr. Dorman um, saw me for 50 minutes, five to six days a week. The first three, three to six months even, we did not, I didn't speak, I rocked back and forth. She was right out of an old textbook, the old crepline description of a catatonic schizophrenic. I was sitting like this, in a fetal position on the chair, and I didn't look up, and he would sit there and he would sit there the entire 50 minutes with me not saying a word, rocking back and forth. Sometimes she would sit catatonically still uh, with just a slight little rock, and she was so shut down, she didn't even swallow her own saliva. She actually left her mouth open a little bit, and her saliva drooled down all over the front of her dress and dripped in a string off the hem into a puddle on the floor. And people would talk about how I looked. You right know, in front of you? Right in front of me. What kind of things would they say? Well, there were these two volunteers there, and they were older ladies, and one lady said, look at her poor dear. Some of them just never make it. Isn't it a shame? Presuming you well, couldn't understand. Well, they thought I couldn't hear it, and I could. I mean, yeah, I was psychotic. Yeah, I was hearing, but, but I could hear that too. Isn't it much easier to give somebody a pill and get rid of them? You know, when I worked in a hospital that gave shock, if the psychiatric resident was angry at a patient and had no insight into it, within two weeks the patient was being given electroshock treatment. And if there's one, hist one fact that you can glean from the history of psychiatry, it's the power of psychiatrists to be deluded about the merits of their therapies. And there's various reasons for that. But history tells us that really clear. Because the way it tells us that is we see so many discarded therapies that when they first came up, they were seen as miracle therapies. They were seen as cures. For schizophrenia? For, well, for insanity or schizophrenia. I mean, you know, if you go back far enough, bleeding people was a cure. Uh, spinning people around was a cure. Uh, you know, electroshock was a cure. Metrazole convulsive therapy was a cure. You know, scrambling the frontal lobes was a cure. Through lobotomy? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so lobotomy, the frontal lobes are the frontal part of our brain, right? When that was introduced in the 40s, really, it was seen as a miracle therapy. And when psychiatrists initially did research and evaluated the patients who had had their frontal lobes scrambled or cut off, cut off, 
they, they basically concluded it couldn't make people with schizophrenia worse. It could only help them. These are things that, uh, when you look back on it, you go, oh my God, how, bar how barbaric could we be? My sense is somewhere down the road, we're going to look at the current medications that we use now and go, how barbaric. She would sit and rock and knead her fingers in this kind of agonized, um, just a, it was a declaration of agony and rock. Grit her teeth like this. Finally, about, I'd say, four to five months into seeing him, he made a comment. He said, reality could be pretty scary, can't it? And it was like, wham, an antenna went up. Nobody had ever told me that. Nobody. Here I was just doing my own internal world thing. It hit a chord. And I thought, how did he know? How does he know? And that was the beginning, uh, the, the start of beginning to have trust. That was when the antenna went up. I didn't know that because she didn't tell me until, you know, uh, eight years later. <laughs> In time, during our sessions, little by little, I started to open up. And I didn't open up all at once. It was a process because for me to trust, was kind of like a death sentence because my experience was to trust, especially in people close to you, meant that you were going to be hurt or even abandoned, maybe. You sit and you point out what a safe room they're in. You remind them that you're not going to give them drugs no matter what they say or do, and you're not going to lock them up no matter what they say or do, that you're just here to, to be there and talk with them about who they are and what's going on. And you just see people begin to regain their trust in another human being. Could you describe the best qualities that your therapist had that helped you? Courage, humor, the whole thing that set up the rest of my life. We were minors. I had the map, she had the light. <laughs> Many times we as therapists have to carry that hope for our patients because they don't have it. And so we have to carry that light and eventually they can take it. So we were minors together. She kept saying, take me along, take me along. She had a really strong teamwork with her doctor, with Frieda from Reichman. They both liked each other very much. They both had a family feeling towards each other. There was a kind of psychological adoption that happened. And she said more than once, I'm not mentally ill, I never have been. I don't know what it's like. That's, for, that's your job, to tell me that. The therapist can act as a reliable guide, a guide into the mind, into the horrors, and a guide with regard to the realities of the world. I see everybody as like a new world, a new culture, really. And each one has their language, and each one has their, their experience. And to me, it's very exciting to enter this new world and learn a new language with this person, rather than make them learn my language. You know, you go to most hospitals, and uh, in the emergency room, they'll say, well, he's talking gibberish, and uh, he doesn't make sense. And you created an alternate language? Oh, yeah. What did you call it? Irian. Irian. Mm-hmm. Could you still speak that? I know words of it. Did anyone there believe in you, any of your coworkers, or they all think you were crazy? Mostly thought I was crazy. Um, no, no one really, no one believed in it. They thought it was just uh, Dr. Dorman's experiment. Most mental health professionals would have never seen a seriously disturbed person get better. 
the treatments they give are to make people less disturbing sick people. It wasn't uh, following the rule book about it, so it clearly was an experiment. Everybody thought I was crazy. Even others, other residents said, well, he thinks he can talk to schizophrenic, so that makes him schizophrenic. You can learn and study about schizophrenia. There are theories and there are approaches, but when you're in a room with somebody, they never quite fit, you know, the formulas or the book, the textbook descriptions. And so you have to be willing to tolerate a certain ambiguity and also to rely on your own creativity because everyone is different and, and even one person might be different from day to day, from hour to hour. Why'd you stick by her? I mean, what gave you faith in her? You know, she never missed an appointment. And she had choice in coming or not coming? Sure. She didn't have to come. Six days a week. I would get to the office, and she would be leaning up against the wall. Eyes. Uh, after about a year of, of seeing her, she closed her eyes and would shuffle around the ward with through little slits, you know, bumping into things uh, and uh, bumping into tables. And, but sitting and quiet, she would have her eyes closed. There she was up against the wall in this peculiar tilt that she would kind of tilt up against the wall. I kept my eyes closed for two of those years. Wait, wait, so you kept your eyes closed literally? Literally, my eyes were closed. And I must really specify that to me, it was not like, oh, I'm going to close my eyes. It had nothing. Literally, they closed, and to me, I couldn't open them. But the point is, she never missed an appointment, and she was always on time, always on time. I made those sessions with Dr. Dorman because he had planted a seed. And as we progressed, that seed was watered. And he would always address what's underneath the delusion, underneath the appearance. He would always appeal to that part of me that was healthy. And you know what? There is always within a person a healthy part, no matter how small. And he told me that. He said, Kathy, I knew you had a well piece. Might not have been that big, but it was there. Do you feel your therapist loved you? She loved. Uh, she loved the health in me. She loved the strength in me. Those are the weapons. Those are the weapons. At the beginning, I kind of saw him as Jesus, you know, because he was there and he was kind and he listened. But the more I talked and developed a connection with Dr. Dorman, the psychotic process got worse. I started hearing voices to kill Dr. Dorman. Schizophrenics take life to, to the edge in some way. They live on the edge in many ways. And many of us are frightened of that, but others of us get excited by that, by that edge and being right there and how can we, you know. And so there's something about that that I think attracts a certain type of therapist to work with, with schizophrenics. How was it for you when she wanted to kill you? I remember when we first talked about it. Said, well, Catherine, maybe it's the same for me and uh, why you hear voices against your mother. For you, closeness and tenderness can be a horror because it puts you in a terrible position of smallness and dependency. Maybe that's why you're hearing voices against me is really the, the development of something tender. You know what happened? She never said a word, but afterwards the nurses heard her just crying deeply in her room uh, after I said that. And I didn't say any more than that. What was happening was my internal psychotic world was being slowly uh, cut away. He was challenging it, I guess. He was challenging it. And this is all on an unconscious, subconscious level. So I had suicide attempts. I, in the hospital? In the hospital. Of what variety of suicide attempts? Well, um, I tried hanging myself when Dr. Dorman was on vacation. 
I literally had the sash around and was on the suitcase. It was in my closet. And my roommate had just darted by the door and she saw me and she just shouted for a nurse. And so, and I was already up there. I was already. So you were going to kick it out and just hang. Mm -hmm. And when he got back from his vacation, he came up on a weekend to have a therapy session with me on the suicide ward to, to process all these things. What if she had killed herself when you'd been away? Well, that would have been a horror. Um, I assumed that she was making, among other things, a statement of both despair and that I was away. She must have felt rejected by you, too. Or abandoned? Probably. Probably both. But you know, um, that was part of her learning curve. Part of the learning curve is that I had to go away, that she had to exist separate from me. So she had to learn to live without you. That's correct. So it was actually good for her that That's you right. went away. That's right. See, there's a danger, though. When people feel despairing in the moment, you can find that there isn't a, a full commitment to kill oneself. But one can end up, she could have ended up killing herself by accident. And your suicide attempts? Uh, the, the usual. Uh, um, cutting your wrists with razor blades. Uh, apparently, it was n not the usual one or two. Bang I mean, little. It was um, deep, and I kept going at it, but I never did find anything that was good enough, and I just kind of get tired of doing it. I had to face these inner demons. I couldn't go around it. I couldn't go above it. I couldn't go under it. Trying to just alleviate symptoms was tried on me with the stelazine and the thorazine. That did not work. Did you ever take any psychiatric medication when you were hospitalized at Chestnut Lodge? Well, if chloral hydrate, second all, nebutol, and the tall, the tall talls, our psychiatric medication, yeah, a bung full of it. Did they help you? Well, what you do is you get a night's sleep. Somebody comes along and clubs you. Were you on medication the whole time you were hospitalized? No, Dr. Dorman uh, told my parents when he had a consultation with them that he did not want Kathy to have another crutch. He wanted her to know that when she gets well, she did it herself. The difference between the pre-medication and the medication era was that when a patient was able to think clearly, to be stronger, to be trustful in the pre-medication era, they could know that they were doing it, not that a drug was doing it to them. I prefer to work with them without the medication because at least I know also what I'm dealing with because the medication also blurs and, and covers up certain, certain things and then I don't know exactly what I'm dealing with, neither do they. He thought that I really hated my mother and I told him, you're wrong, I love my mother. Probably I loved my mom too much. I always felt overprotective. You don't have to be right all the time. That's one of the most crippling ideas a therapist could possibly have. Therapists working with people with schizophrenia. A therapist of any kind, actually. People don't need perfect therapists. If we have to be correct all the time, nobody could do therapy. But if we have to do our damnedest to try to understand, that we can do. And that's all it takes, and that's a great deal. When in life do you have a bright, kind person doing their damnedest to try to understand you? And how did he take it when you, when you uh, he disagreed? Listened. He, he listened. He, he said, OK, let's, I want to hear about it. Let's talk about it. And he, so he and was he very wanted, respectful. Yeah. And you know, just the very act that he did that, he, it started to make me feel like I was Somebody. She never stripped me without my consent. 
So she was very respectful. Yes. She knew the difference between problems and symptoms. She knew the difference between being creative and being crazy and being religious and being crazy. And that was, that was delicate stuff for me. We had an I-thou relationship. But the previous... Can you explain that to the... It was a, an I-thou. I was a human being. Versus... Versus an I-it. Do you believe that someone could recover fully from schizophrenia and let's say live a life without medication? Without medication? No, I do not. I don't think so. Medication seems like it's pretty necessary. In the era of neuroleptics, we've had two good long-term outcome studies. The first was done by Courtney Harding, who's now at Boston University. Not without medication. I don't believe it's possible. She followed the long-term outcomes of people who, in the 1950s, diagnosed with schizophrenia on the backwards of a Vermont State Hospital and given up for lost. I don't know if they could recover, but somehow adapt and be able to cope with it. Now, it so happened that in the 60s, Vermont had sort of a, a very sort of socially progressive model for rehabbing these people. So she followed them up in the 1980s. It's maybe slightly possible, but I, probably not. And here's what she found. I don't think so. They could recover, but not fully. She found that one third were completely recovered. Asymptomatic, out there, you didn't ever know they were schizophrenic. Don't recall that I've seen those cases. Another 34% were doing pretty well, some pretty good social functioning. I don't think so. 32% were, were pretty chronically ill. I don't think that they can recover fully because that's something I believe something so strong would be embedded in your brain. There's something real key here. Of those who had recovered completely, they all shared one trait. And that trait was. Everyone had quit taking his or her medication. No, no, not without medication. No recoveries in those who followed the par paradigm of care where you stayed on drugs for life. I don't really think so. No, I think you need to take your medication, yes. The second one was just released. I think you could live without medication. I don't know if you'd recover. Following people diagnosed with schizophrenia in Chicago for 15 years. And they found, and this was just reported in 2007, May 2007, that 40% of all people diagnosed with schizophrenia who got off their medications eventually recovered. Asymptomatic, doing well. Not fully, but I think they could live a pretty normal life. Now, only 5% of those who stayed on their medications recovered. I don't think so. So that's the best long-term study we have in modern times, and it tells you quite clearly that if you want people to recover from schizophrenia, if you want to give them their best chance possible, you get them off the drugs. Fully, no. So that study's done. It's funded by you and me, the taxpayers. Now, you go and find one newspaper that reported on that story. I wouldn't think so. I don't know why I wouldn't think so. Why not? Because the NIMH didn't promote it, psychiatry didn't promote it, and they didn't promote it because it didn't tell the story they wanted to. From what I've heard, no. If the reverse were true, 40% mm -hmm. of those on drugs recovered versus 5% of those off drugs, that story would have been plastered all over the news. From what I have heard, I think it's fairly permanent unless there's medication involved. That's dishonest science. That's of a discipline that's dishonest because when they get results they don't want, they don't broadcast them to the public. I don't know. Doctors don't know. I don't know either. Is Harding's story well known? Do you, do you think young psychiatrists are being told, you know, we, we followed schizophrenia patients up for 30 years and we found that Believe it or not, we don't, have to, we don't have to be so despairing. A third completely recover. Now, they all happen to be off their drugs, so what we should do is help them get off their drugs. Right. I started getting despairing at the end of my residency. She'd been in the hospital close to three years, and she clearly looked worse than when she came in. And my inner thought was that she would end up in the state hospital, that I had failed. And her mother said this, I'll just take her home. All she needs is love. I turned to Catherine and I said, Catherine, you know you can't go home. You'll either kill your mother or you'll kill yourself. And there's no way to get better. But since I was leaving residency, I transferred her to uh, a small private psychiatric hospital so I could continue to see her. And the first visit, there she was still in that catatonic kind of thing. And she also had a high pitch squeaky voice in those days too. And the first thing she said when I sat down was she did this. 
Thank you, Dr. Dorman, for not letting me go home. I found it so um, disruptive at first because I was put in a room with, uh, with four other girls, one of these dormitory rooms. And at UCLA, I just had one roommate. And here I was laying in bed trying to stop the voices, you know, trying to concentrate and go down and do what I... Oh, basically to zone out. Yeah, zone out. And here these girls were talking about what psych... To, oh, did you see John? What a bod. And he would make a good lay. And it was driving me even more. It was like... So I had that going on. And I would meet with Dr. Dorman. And I would say, I need to be in my own private room. It's too painful in there. I can't concentrate. And he said, Kathy, you can handle it. You don't need to be isolated anymore. And it was like, you know... And you know what? That was the best thing he ever did. I had come out from the disturbed ward almost three years. And that's long after they kind of give up. In most state hospitals, it's two years. And I don't mean two years in a day. I mean two years. And then what do they do? Then you're chronic. You're back ward. Oh, I see. Uh, and they give you a chance, they try, but you know, we're not gonna make it, we've got other, it's a triage thing. And I was almost three and, and heavy. As I stayed in that room, more and more, I was diverted from all the other stuff in my head. Not only was I diverted, but it was like I started becoming interested in wanting to know what's lay and what psych tech is that? Convalescence takes a hell of a long time. For one thing, you have to learn the difference between problems and symptoms. You have to learn the difference. You have to learn how to act. All of a sudden, I began feeling wonder. I began feeling curiosity. And we talked about it. And our, our sessions became more where I really did all the talking in the sessions. I would talk about wanting one day to really have a boyfriend and things like that, things I would never have spoken of before. And I had to really process the new feelings. I was develop developing feelings again. I had split off my feelings a long time ago. One day in OT, occupational therapy, I was able to open my eyes all the way. And everybody in OT, occupational therapy, came over and hugged me. I started drawing. I drew pictures of a mermaid, of a beautiful mermaid. I used colors. The day after that happened, um, I went for my session. She said, my eyes are fluttering. I can't stop them. I said, oh, yes. She said, and then she did this. First time in two years, big wide eyes like this. She looks around. I was stunned. I didn't know what to say. But I saw everything upside down, like even the day before, like you would be upside down and you would be like in slow motion and I would see you through my mouth. In other words, my eyes would be where my mouth is, so I would be looking. And I remember telling Dr. Dorman this and he said, he said, Kathy, you've had sensory deprivation for quite a few years. This is normal. It, it will start coming back. Now, I asked her, like, uh, later, well, what was the event that triggered that? She said, there was no event. It was an accumulation of personal experience, the personal experience of the horror of her madness, the personal experience of who she had become as a person, and most importantly, that that experience, she said, quote, became boring. And then came the real work. I found myself spontaneously crying when I would go on outings with other clients to the movie theater. And there would be nothing sad on the movie, but all of a sudden something would trigger something, and I would cry. All these feelings that I held in and I repressed For were decades. coming out just, just like a dam, like a dam had been punctured. Mm. They were coming out in all kinds of places. The schizophrenia had been a part of my identity. And it, it was like I had to, in a way, grieve for that. 
Catherine would sit out in the little patio and just stare at a green tree, and she would say, it's just, it's just so beautiful, that tree, to see again. And so I knew that she was re-entering the world. Everything looked new to me. The flowers looked new. It was like the sun had a new meaning to me. The moon had a new, everything was like something out of a fairy tale in a way, but yet I knew it wasn't a fairy tale. She says, I'm ready to see the world. And she grinned because of the double entendre. And uh, she always had that little sense of humor from that point on. Even before there was sometimes a little irony in what she would say. See, under all that schizophrenia, she was there. All schizophrenics are, all humans are. When I was discharged January 1973, I ended up going there for day treatment for another four months. But I saw Dr. Dorman every day, Monday through Friday. I took the bus to his office, and I saw him for 50, 55 minutes. When I got out of the hospital, I was living out, outside, still an outpatient. And I was singing in the church choir. I went back to school. I took summer courses and I got my GED and I was going to classes. I took psychology, philosophy, and, and I think sociology. And I tried with everything I had. I gave it everything I had to be present there, to be there. And I got straight Fs. And somebody said to me, you're a very odd person. You're a strange person. You seem to be not here. I remember going to him, telling him, you know, what's the purpose of me getting better like this when my brain's damaged? I thought, the world is full of titans. These people are titanic. I can't study. I can never do what they do. What good is it if I can't go to school? How am I ever going to do that? He told me, he said, Kathy, every faculty you had before you got ill will come back. Give yourself time. <sighs> I held on to that like a life raft, because at that point, I was starting to feel suicidal. It happened uh, when I was in college in my second year. I was losing that schizophrenic identity. I looked in the mirror and I didn't recognize anything I was seeing. It was awesome and wonderful and terrifying at the same time. And I didn't recognize the life I was living. I was starting to develop a new identity. And I went bonkers. If I didn't have Dr. Dorman to process all these new experiences and feelings. And I ended up back upstairs. It would have been so easy. Disturbed allow myself to slip back. I felt so desperate. That next semester I skipped. Some guy came in to do something in the cabinets and I said, is this going to be my life? And then I took it the fall. Am I going to spend my time going out, getting socked in a kisser and coming back here? And I got straight B's on all those classes. And he shrugged and said, it's worth a try, ain't it? And from then on, I was doing well with the school and the studying. Pick yourself up off the floor, spit out the carpet, and get on with it again. Do you believe that someone could recover fully from schizophrenia, let's say, and live without any medication? Probably not. You know the data from cross-cultural studies, that in countries where they can't afford to medicate, the long-term recovery rate is twice as good as it is in countries where nearly everybody's medicated. My instinct is probably no. And the chronic disability rate is twice as high in the United States and other countries where almost everybody's medicated as it is in countries where they can't medicate. These are the World Health Organization studies. I think it'd be really difficult. So it was US and six other sort of European countries, rich countries. And then the poor countries were initially India, 
Colombia, Nigeria? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I, I really... You know where the best outcomes were? In rural India. And there, only 2% of patients or 4% of patients were kept on antipsychotic medications. If there was an absolute recovery, that'd be great, but it might also just be sort of learning to live with it. Now, if I'm a doctor and I look at those outcomes and I hypothesize that medication use is a variable that changes long-term outcomes, and I find that outcomes are better in countries where they don't maintain patients on the drugs like long-term, what am I going to decide? As I understand it, most psychological disorders are lifelong diseases. Um, and I think you can recover in the sense that you can have a, half, a happy, balanced life if you're on your medication. I don't know that it can be cured at the moment. I mean, if there is a psychological imbalance and there were some way that they could go in your brain and change your brain chemistry permanently, then sure. But I don't think that's available at the moment. I'm going to go, oh, Christ. We should be doing something different. We should not be keeping me people on their meds all their lives. We should be trying to minimize use. Without medicine, I think that it's impossible. But was there any discussion of that? No. The way things work now? No, I don't think that it's possible. Was there any acknowledgment of that by Western doctors? No. I sincerely doubt it. They seem to get worse. Most mental health professionals never even heard of those studies, even though they're done by one of the most reputable research groups in the world. I think that uh, you cannot recover from schizophrenia, but you can keep it under control. Reputable and non-radical, too. That's right. They're, they're not the least bit radical. In fact, they did the studies to show how good the new medications were. No, probably not. But they were honest. When they found the opposite, they didn't believe it at first, thought it must be that in countries where they don't medicate, they're using different diagnostic criteria. But they published their findings saying, we don't believe it. No, I don't think so. Then, because they're good researchers, they repeated it very carefully using the same diagnostic criteria in all six countries and found exactly the same thing. Probably not. You see, if they worked for a drug company, they'd have said, this explains it, but they would do no research to show it. The important thing was to make sure that drugs kept selling. No, I would say that you would need medication. And in fact, they concluded, the World Health Organization investigators concluded, that living in a developed country is, quote, a strong predictor that you'll never fully recover. I think we would be hard pressed to find someone who wouldn't continue their like hallucinations or delusions just through counseling. So I'm not so sure that something other than medication would be able to fully alleviate all the symptoms. I was in New York sitting on a bus and I there it was again the whole business right down I was schizophrenic and I said to myself wait a minute shh, and by this time your therapist had already died right oh yeah hey shh, what's this all about well schizophrenics don't do that Meaning don't take a look at themselves from the outside and say, hey, what's going on here? Have a, con have, yeah. have a very sane and rational conversation yeah. with yourself. And I said to myself, oh, mother's little sweetheart. Let's figure this out. Aha. Uh -huh. You forgot what it was like. You had the desire to escape somewhere, have you? His mother's little sweetheart wanting to go someplace else. <laughs> Would Frida talk that way to you? No, she was much gentler. Suffer a little smarter, will you? So we suffered a little smarter. Me and my brains. <laughs> and you didn't end up back in the hospital? No. How long have you been married to Joanne? 51 years. 51 years. Yeah. In the whole time you've been married to her, have you seen any symptoms of schizophrenia? No. Not in her. <laughs> <laughs> Were you ever worried that you might see it? No. Frankly, no. No, I never really did. What led you to have such confidence in her? We were together for a while before we were married. Uh, 
I just felt that she was free of all symptoms. Do you feel that you are at any risk of becoming schizophrenic again? Never. Uh, I have no fear of that whatsoever. She was given an MMPI when she was admitted, and the schizophrenic spike and the paranoid spike were extraordinarily high. It was clearly the MMPI that would be interpreted by an objective observer as this person suffers from schizophrenia. And then I asked her 10 years later to complete another MMPI, so 1979, two years post-treatment, and it was within the normal range. There are no spikes. The schizophrenia is gone. Have you taken any psychiatric medication since I have since not then? taken any psychiatric medication since November 1969 when I entered UCLA. Do you ever dream that you've returned to being psychotic? I used to the first four or five years. First four or five years when? Of recovery. This was from 1973 to about 1977 or 8. Periodically, I would have dreams where I, in the dream, I would be back where I was hearing voices. And Kill yourself. Kill your mother. With Kill the yourself. disorganized Kill thoughts yourself. and everything. But I was still seeing Dr. Dorman, and so we discussed that in the sessions, and he said, see how healthy you're getting? It's coming out in your dreams now. It's no longer a part of your conscious reality. And he said again, he said, and in time, you won't even have it in your dreams. And he was right on. Do you ever dream that you've returned to All being, the time. Schizo being psychotic or schizophrenic? All the time. I mean, not every night, no, but every so often. Is it a fa fair question to ask for a, a type of, a, 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 like a specific, like a, a dream that might encapsulate that? Well, I'm in a hospital somewhere in restraints or something, and I'm back again, only I'm older and I don't have the necessary vim and vigor to do much about it. Must be a relief to wake up. Yeah. <laughs> quickest recovery ever. Yeah, quickest recovery ever, yeah. Do you feel you're all well? I feel I'm a very well-balanced person. Do I at times get anxiety and, and get stressed out? Yes. Do I at times get depressed sometimes? Yes. But the difference is I know I have within me the tools and ability to not let that overcome me and become my life. What are the tools you use now? If you feel bad, get a get a one of the tapes of stuff I've sung and bay and howl against the music. I journal, sing alto parts. I will play music. I've sung a whole lot of wonderful stuff. Go do it again. I will dance. Dance has always been a very cathartic experience, a very therapeutic experience in my life. Work. I do poetry, a lot of poetry. Sickle up a rocky acre. Meditation. Flick the sickle. Making sure I spend time in quiet time, staying in the present moment, appreciating the present moment. Call somebody up. It's such a gift because there was a part of my life, almost seven years, where I had no quiet in my mind. Oh, I, all the noise. I had only chatter, chatter, chatter. To have a chat. The greatest gift is wanting to be with people. Go skiing with friends doing the opposite of isolating, but really loving the contact with people and seeing that humanness in people, the sacred, the sacred in each one of us. Do you believe someone might be able to recover fully from schizophrenia and live a life without medication? I think anything's possible. Yeah, I believe anything's possible. It is possible, so it certainly is possible. That I don't know, I hope so. Let's say you were a young person now, let's say you were 14, 15, 16, and... God help me. <laughs> and, and you had schizophrenia now. I think so. I mean, it's, I think, you know what, it, 
Depends on the degree and the level of schizophrenia. I think it's possible. It must be possible. I think it could be possible. What would happen to me today would be so much less good. I'd be put on an adolescent unit somewhere, and then I'd die. You never know, maybe. It might, it might take years, year. it might take like a lot of time, but you never know. I think that if you had the right kind of doctors and the right kind of therapists involved, it's possible. It's true. Yes. I would like to think so. I think there's always hope, you know. I don't see why not. It's a, it's a psychological condition, and everybody's walking around crazy. Some people just uh, can hide it better than others. Yeah, you wonder, just a slightly different, your parents had taken a left turn instead of a right turn oh. and dropped you off at one place instead of another. Well, I would not be alive because for me, I had suicide was my ticket out. So you think it's, you would have killed yourself? Uh, pro most probably. Uh, I, I don't know whether it's possible, frankly. Those schizophrenics I've known haven't done well. One uh, jumped off a building. There are people who wake up from coma after being there for 18 years, so yeah, I do believe it. Before you met Kathy and heard her story, did you know that people could recover from schizophrenia and live, live lives without medication? No, I did not. I thought it was uh, sort of like a one-way street. I think it can be possible. Yeah, I think it seems feasible, um, especially if they have good support group, good group of friends. Did you make friends in the hospital? Yeah. Good friends? Yeah. Still. I believe it's possible, sure, sure. I believe so. I certainly don't believe that it's impossible. We had a, a um, reunion, four of us. Really? Yeah. All, all diagnosed with schizophrenia? Yeah. All recovered? Three and a half. Three and a half. Three and a half. I think if they wanted to, if they 100% if they passionately, like with all their being, wanted to, I think they could. She died, by the way. Which, the? The one who half made it. Yes, I do. If they have the, the proper treatment and they're also, they have uh, uh, the willingness to uh, change their life. I would hope so. But the other two are fine. Hard lives, hard work. Taking psychiatric medications? Certainly not. Well, since I don't believe medication is necessarily necessary, sure. I think it is possible, but I think it really depends on the individual. I care, I care about people who, who are in going through what I went through because I've been there. Probably, I think the, <clears throat> I think the, the mind is uh, capable of enormous change, so probably. They are some of the most beautiful, uh, courageous people I've ever met. If they really wanted and understood what they had, their disease, that yeah, they could probably do it. I'd like to think so, since I don't believe in medication. And it saddens me when I see society and the media portraying them as these buffoons, as these psychotic, knife-wielding, yeah, I'd hope so. I'd hope so. Um, although the cases that I've heard of that come into the newspaper um, seem to be people that have come off their medication and had a bit of trouble. Sure, that happens, but that is not the majority of people who have a, a mental disorder. Yeah. And sometimes I think medication is, you know, can be adverse. One of the things that I really hope for in this work that I do is that someday everybody that struggles with psychosis have the option of having meaningful therapy if they choose to. I'd like to think they could. You know, I would hope that would, would be the goal. I hope so. I hope that, that somebody cares enough to try to help. To have somebody come to you and be more open with you than your best friend is ever going to be. And to talk to you about their lives and what they're going through and their hopes and desires and fears is such a privilege to be allowed to get to know people like that. I mean, there's no other way to do it.
other than being a therapist. You keep learning how to do therapy as long as you're alive and doing therapy. That's the, what makes it absolutely fascinating to be a therapist. Uh, possibly. Possibly. I would hope so. I would hope so. Definitely. Definitely. Every day I wake up and I go to work and I don't know what that day is going to be like. And I love that. <laughs> Some people would hate that because it would make them anxious. I love that. I love that I can't predict that I'm going to be surprised. And I always retain, you know, this sense of wonder and surprise at what a person will bring to me. I do believe there's a possibility for that. I think they could. Yeah, why not? I mean, anything's possible, right? Telling that story was the best thing I ever did. The most rewarding thing I ever did. And the reason it was the most rewarding thing was because I had so many patients, so many people who had been there, including many recovered patients who had experienced neuroleptics, found them horrible, who said, thank you for telling our story. I believe they could. Yes, I did. I think anything's possible. It comes back to what Harry Stack Sullivan said, and that was based on the teachings of his teachers, uh, that we're all more simply human than otherwise. Uh, that we all, every one of us has that potential for breakdown, and, and everyone that's had a breakdown has the potential for recovery. Yeah, I believe in everybody's possibility for change at, at any given moment. Absolutely. I think uh, people can recover from anything. At the end of Catherine's treatment, she said that it, she thought it was time for her to um, leave because she couldn't, she needed to gain experience away from me. <laughs> I agreed and she said that she would miss me and at that moment I thought my god I'm gonna miss her too looking back the journey was one of the greatest journeys of my life I would never I would not change what I went through I would not change it one bit Are you ever surprised your life turned out the way it's turned out? Not surprised, dumbfounded, shocked, amazed. I got to use my having been sick in a lot of positive ways and that's a great blessing I can talk to you for purpose
That's it. That's all. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anything else you want to add? Got another? No, that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay. That's all. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks a lot. No worries, man. Thank you very much. Hope I helped you.